Hello, everyone. I'm James Milan. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. It is a legislative update with our state rep, or one of our two state reps. Uh, Dave Rogers is with us today. Dave, as always. James, to pleasure you. to see you. Absolutely. And I'll say Happy New Year. Yeah. Even it though it's we're into February, exactly. well into February. Exactly. But I don't think you and I have seen each other yet. So it's been it's been right. It has been I always wonder what what's the etiquette about that? Like how long can you keep saying Happy New Year? But uh, what the heck? So. I like that idea because we still have some stuff on our on our website that would in, you know that's basically saying Happy New Year to people. So you're keeping it current. There I you appreciate go. Appreciate that. There you go. Um, you know, I've I've also. Uh, in this little round of, of conversations with our two reps and, and our senator, I've been had a chance to kind of delve into a little bit of the fact that all of you are, have have um, a certain amount of experience behind you now in in the, the your respective chambers and the state house. And to ask you, I know you are probably I think you're coming up to ten years now, yep, right? That's right. So that's a good solid chunk of time. Um, and congratulations. It's kind of like a nice round number and anniversary Thank you. kind of thing. Um, but I'd like to start before we start talking about the legislation that we that will sure. always fill most of our conversation. Uh, let me just ask you, like, how does that feel? Um, how's your energy? What sure. are you thinking about? You know, looking forward, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for the question, and you know, it's uh, uh, it's quite a feeling. You know, uh, when I first ran as most candidates, I didn't know if I would uh, be elected. Uh, my first race was highly competitive. Had uh, started with five Democrats, a couple of them dropped out, but still three were wow. left, and then a Republican and an Independent. Um, a lot of good candidates, and so um, when you talk to the the limited group of folks who actually follow the stuff closely, mm -hmm. um, I was kind of an underdog. And uh, so I wasn't at all certain I'd get elected to one term, let alone I'm now in my sixth. And uh, so in a sense, I guess I'm saying it was improbable or uh, at least deemed unlikely at the time that I would get elected. And I've been blessed and fortunate to get this opportunity to do public service, something I've always wanted to do. And uh, I would say I've had a heck of a run doing it, uh, been able to get a lot of uh, useful things done for the community and for the Commonwealth as a whole. And I'm still energized uh, uh, by the prospect of doing more. And, and you, like any job, you, you learn the ins and outs, uh, where to invest your energy, maybe where your energy is less well invested, you know, how to, how to be effective mm -hmm. and to um, uh, make a difference. And so uh, it's been... Uh, it's been a great thing to do, and um, looking forward to this session, which is now just underway. Right. We'll talk about that in a sec. Let me just say, though, that that is um, that's really interesting to me to hear what you just said about your first election, because I'm sure you haven't had a, such a uh, an uncertain kind of uh, topography uh, since then, because I personally cannot remember any election local uh, that has involved sounds like at least at some point seven different people that's um, right that's right just, and uh, yeah it was highly competitive and I uh, had a lot of help from a lot of people I I have to be clear that um, you know any successful campaign whether it's school committee or select board city council state legislature governor president whatever people are running for it's a team effort and the candidate is just really just one component of, of a team mm -hmm. Um, and I had a lot of help from a lot of people, uh, including right here in Arlington, people who got to know me, my policy platform, the things I was campaigning to try to accomplish, uh, and uh, got behind me, supported me, and, um, and so, uh, yeah, it's been great. And, you know, being a candidate is, is hard. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I, I had a competitive campaign, uh, one, uh, the last, not this cycle, but the right. one before, mm -hmm. and, you know, look, every job's hard, right? I mean, mm -hmm. every job has its challenges, but um, there's something uniquely challenging about being a candidate. I mean, your name is printed on a ballot for all of your fellow neighbors to That's cast great. judgment on. I remember reading an interview with Obama, listening to an interview. He lost, you know, he lost for Congress, mm -hmm. Barack Obama, and he, uh, it was fascinating to hear him talk about it. He, he ran against Bobby Rush. Bobby Rush was an icon of mm -hmm. the civil rights Absolutely. movement, a Black Panther, 
uh, Obama was ambitious and probably against some advice he got, said, you know what, I'm going for it anyway. And he got thumped, two to one. Mm. And, he ta- and he talks a lot about it. Uh-huh. And I never forget his quote was something, never underestimate how ignominious it is, a public loss that you know you're, all your friends and neighbors know about. You, know, you walk down the street, which one of my neighbors didn't vote for me kind of thing. You know? <laughs> but anyway, I, wow. I, 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 uh, but it's also exciting and challenging. And they say, you know, Try to push yourself out of your comfort zone mm-hmm. and, and do things in life that are um, maybe get you a little beyond what you know you normally would do in, in your career or in your mm-hmm. work. And, and public service has enabled me to do that. You know, before I got elected, I, we were talking before we went on air. I, I had a good job, a lawyer, uh, reasonably successful with that. And um, you know, uh, but I was itching for a new challenge and a, a new frontier, a new way to use my whatever talents I may have to mm-hmm. try to and uh, so I'm glad I did it in that I, I was a little bit stagnating as a lawyer. Right. I, I, Being comfortable can be a little insidious, right? Yeah, and, that's a great way to put it. Being yeah. comfortable can be insidious. I was comfortable, good pay, good good job, but not really growing, not mm-hmm. really challenging myself and so and there's lots of different ways to challenge yourself. Good God, you don't need to go and run for office. <laughs> right. You don't need to be judged by all your, fr- your friends but, and neighbors. But, you know, I, I, this is what I did, mm-hmm. and, and it's, uh, it's been a, a really um, unique experience. And, 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 it, and it's really, in the end, as much as we're talking about me and me running, it's not about me. It really has to be about the people you represent right. and trying to make an impact, trying to make a difference. Because that's what makes it interesting for me when I can have... Uh, a meaningful impact. Yeah, and I think if again, I'm just you know on a treadmill, but not really uh, making things happen, then that's that's no good either. Mm-hmm. So I mean, we were also talking before you know the camera started rolling about the fact that you know ten years in is an accomplishment in and of itself, and again, nice round number and all that. But what it really means in a lot of ways is that you 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 know how to get things done in a way that you couldn't possibly when you had a year, two years, three years behind under your belt. Um, so let me ask you, uh, let's, let's start by talking about, uh, I've gotten an education in how things work at, at the, in the legislature, and sure. I know that with the beginning of a new term, which started in January, um, you basically have to start at square one with all the legislation that didn't quite get over the finish line before. Right. Um, and you're not starting at square one in terms of the experience that you've amassed and how you're going to approach getting that legislation passed. You can use all of that hard-won wisdom, I'm sure. But in terms of process, things are, are back to, to square one, right? That's right. Um, so which, let, let's start by talking about which are of the, you know, which bills or which subject areas contain bills of yours that, you know, you feel like you've been working on for a while, um, but didn't quite make it over the finish line, and you're really, you know, kind of want to... St- Plant sure. your flag and make sure, yeah, I'm sure. starting energetically on this you yeah. know, with, the, with these things. Well, if I might, I, I would divide that into two categories. And, and the first category is um, I've been reappointed the chair of the Higher Education Committee. So the substantive work of the legislature is done through the committee process. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's on transportation and the MBTA, there's the Transportation Committee. Um, in my case, I'm the chair of the Higher Education Committee. Of course, Massachusetts is famous not only in the country but worldwide for our private institutions of higher learning, MIT, Harvard, Tufts, BU, BC, Northeastern, and many others. But we also have 29 Mm -hmm. institutions of higher learning that are public uh, colleges, the UMass system, nine state colleges and universities, and 15 community colleges. And that's primarily um, what this committee uh, has oversight and also uh, legislation that would impact uh, those institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as I'm sure you know and, and your listeners would know, there was a big ballot question last year, the so-called millionaire's tax, okay. a surtax of 4% on incomes above a million dollars a year with the money to go to education and transportation. Mm-hmm. And so um, this session, as chair of the Higher Education Committee, I hope to work with my colleagues uh, and uh, develop some legislation that will impact public higher education. Uh, Because far more, as I mentioned all those world-renowned 
private institutions, uh, uh, but far more uh, students from the public colleges and universities stay here, mm -hmm. raise their families here, have their careers here, work here. So um, it's really important that we get it right and that we have thriving public institutions mm -hmm. because that is literally the future of the Commonwealth. Those students stay here. And, um, yeah, and those students probably, by and large, like, like you were just saying, on the whole, more of them are from here, you know, kind of have been here for much of their lives, you know, where, again, with the private institutions, they can come from, from anywhere in the country and the world, drawing out a large part of their student body. But these public institutions really serve, you know, the Massachusetts uh, population, um, you know, in, in, a, in a particular way. That's right. That's 100% true, and so uh, Governor Healy has a proposal, our new governor, um, for those 25 and over to get free uh, community college, to get them back into um, advancing their skills and their education. Uh, there are a number of proposals, and the key that the advocates point out, and there are a lot of voices, a lot of stakeholders, but if you listen to the advocates for um, for students and for public higher education, they tend to pick the year 2001 as the benchmark, as the, the high water mark of the state contributing to public higher education. And uh, if you look at the data, it is true that over time, the share that the state now pays mm -hmm. has gone down as a percentage. And so students are bearing more of the costs. Student debt, we know, is in the news. Matter of fact, today, I think, in front of the United States Supreme yep. Court. The President Biden's plan for student debt relief uh, is on the docket mm -hmm. and being debated and argued. But the very fact that you know we have a, an American president with a proposal, it's at the Supreme Court, tells you how big of an issue this mm -hmm. is, the student debt and how do you finance higher education. So that is started with your question about what do I hope to accomplish or yep. make an impact and I, I foresee that we'll do something. Now, exactly what is hard to say. It's the session just started. Right. But, but it something. is a really interesting moment for you to be reappointed because, as you said, with the fair share amendment, the other, uh, the other way that that is referred to, the millionaire's tax amendment, right, uh, or, or the, the, that, that passed, um, you should have some money to work with, right? I mean, you should have the means to be able to, to get something done, like you said, whatever the form that takes is. I hope so. That's mm -hmm. right. And mm -hmm. we'll see, you know, there are forecasts about how much the millionaire's tax, uh, the so-called fair share amendment, would generate. Mm -hmm. But now we're going to start getting the data. Mm -hmm. Now the DOR, the Department of Revenue, will begin to get monthly receipts mm -hmm. to assess how much revenue are we really going to get from this fair share amendment. And um, so we'll have to see. The other thing is that as I predicted, I knew this would happen. No sooner was the ink dry on the fair share amendment that there are groups and um, people trying to push back and already mm -hmm. chip away. Like, for instance, there's a proposal um, to cut capital gains tax, the short-term capital gains tax, that is primarily, not totally, but primarily paid by wealthier folks. Mm -hmm. So if you get money in from the fair share amendment, but you start giving it back through a cut to capital gains, like, where are we really going to shake out on new revenue? Mm -hmm. And we'll see. I mean, there, there are tax cut proposals. Governor Healy ran uh, on her campaign on a promise that she would have some package of tax cuts. She's now um, put it forward just, mm -hmm. I think, yesterday or the day before. So mm -hmm. uh, that will get debated. Uh, but certainly higher education and my role as chair of the Higher Education Committee, I hope to make a difference. And then, of course, I have a lot of legislation that I filed myself mm -hmm. that I hope to move forward, some of which I know you and I have talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll highlight maybe just a couple things. One is access to counsel. Um, you know, mm. two-thirds of uh, low-income people that go to civil legal aid societies for help because they can't afford a lawyer are turned away. So, for instance, in Massachusetts, we have GBLS, that's the Greater Boston Legal Services. We have Cambridge Somerville Legal Services. These are lawyers who are public service lawyers and provide legal help to those who are so low income, they literally cannot afford a lawyer. And um, so um, they turn away a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I have a bill that would provide, in a limited circumstance, for those facing eviction, those in housing court, 
would have essentially a right to a lawyer or access to counsel. And um, if you're a criminal defendant in America and you're accused of a crime, but you can't afford a lawyer, one is automatically appointed for you. Mm -hmm. We've all heard the Miranda warnings mm -hmm. on TV mm -hmm. or watching our favorite shows, you know. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed. Well, the question is, what about in civil court? Mm -hmm. What happens to low-income people when they go into court? And we know in housing, 90% um, of landlords have a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So the folks that uh, control the property and uh, they are wealthy enough or have enough money, they have lawyers, almost all of them. Mm -hmm. Less than 10% of tenants have a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So you talk about a lopsided arrangement. Uh, you know, we all recite the Pledge of Allegiance, and what, how does it end? When we think about America, what is America? And justice for all. Mm -hmm. Sadly, uh, sometimes that's not true. There isn't justice for all. No. There's a lopsided system. And I've been working to address that. It's become one of my signature pieces of legislation. When I first introduced it, it was uh, sort of me and a couple other people, and it's like seven years ago. But um, we now have over 200 groups supporting it. And this is the most interesting to me. Um, we have landlords supporting it. Not all, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, not all landlords, right, but, but, landlord's a, but, but, some, but some of the big hmm. property owners mm -hmm. support it. And I think the reason is that if, I know you're a lawyer as well, and I've, I've gone to housing court. Housing court's chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is um, people spilling out in the hallways on days when there are hearings, when there are mm -hmm. a lot of cases on the docket. And um, I think a, a lot of landlords that support it, support it because of the efficient administration mm -hmm. of justice. Mm -hmm. No matter what the outcome's going to be, you can get a clear, uh, consistent resolution. If there are lawyers on both sides, the cases can be processed and move along. And a lot of times it's settled, like, um, oh, look, I'm behind on my rent, but you have a code violation. You fix the code violation and put me on a payment plan. I'll catch up on the rent. Wh whatever the case may be, the lawyers can negotiate a deal, keep people in their houses, which is what we want. We don't right. want more homelessness. Um, so that's a big bill I, I filed yeah. and working on. Um, there's a bunch of others. Um, one I, um, I care about is to do with data privacy. Yeah. I think we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a saying, uh, uh, we don't search Google, Google it searches searches us. us. And the amount of our personal information, think about tracking and location. You're carrying around a smartphone that tells these companies everywhere you are, mm -hmm. everywhere you're going. And I won't go on at, at great, too great a length other than to say, um, I think there's a compendium or a dossier of information on us that most of us can hardly imagine. Mm -hmm. The amount of information the, that these companies are assembling about us is staggering. Every time you watch a YouTube video, they know mm -hmm. uh, what, yeah. you're, what you're watching, what you're listening to, where you're going, who your friends are, on and on and on, and then use that to target you, to manipulate you. Um, and so, long story short, America's data privacy laws are behind Europe. Mm. We don't have as much protection for consumers. And so I've introduced a bill along with a, another state representative, uh, Representative Vargas from Haverhill, uh, working with the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, because they care about privacy and our, our rights as citizens, to um, pass legislation that would put some reasonable constraints on our personal information, what mm. these companies are allowed to do, what they're allowed to do with the information, what information they're allowed to collect, what notification you get. I saw Apple now, if you have an iPhone, mm -hmm. they have the ask not to track. You can click the button that the app won't track you. I've oh. hit that button, I cannot tell you how many times. <laughs> right. Don't allow, don't allow, don't allow. Right, so, but not that, but that's just Apple and that's just one limited part of your life when you're mm -hmm. on your, there's what you search online. So mm -hmm. that's a big, big ideas, what we're going to do about data privacy. And um, there's legislation also pending at the federal level, so we have to be mindful of that. But there's room, I think, to operate here at the state level and do something to... I really hope, I really hope you're right, Dave, though it does feel to me like, wow, that's a major uphill battle. It is, because these are powerful companies. Mm -hmm. Think about the money that Apple and Facebook and Google and... Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, the lobbyists have reached out to me. I mean, I know they have, they're very well represented. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and to be fair, you know, it, the legislation has to be written in a thoughtful way that, mm -hmm. um, because this technology also brings us great benefits. That's, as, that's the other thing is that I was going to say that you have on the other side, those, those who would or should be outraged to know all this stuff are, you know, kind of maybe soft peddling it a little bit because hey, it's more convenient. Hey, you know, oh, so they, so an ad just popped up on my phone. How did they know that? I would be interested in that. But I am, so I'm going right. to go, you know what I mean? Right. People aren't necessarily seeing what the threat is, even if it's, even if it is, you know, very clear uh, yeah. to others. So anyway. Well, the, the, the ramifications are endless about the way society is changing and the way our information is being used. Um, but my bill would set up a Massachusetts Office of Privacy and, and again, set the rules of the road and some sensible guardrails about what these companies can and cannot do. For instance, can they sell your information to other third parties that had nothing to do with the reason you went online in the first place? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's another major bill I filed. I, I did file a bill on rent control, mm -hmm. which we have, a, as you know, a, a major affordable housing crisis in this state. And a matter of fact, at the Globe just two days ago, front page, for those of us who still actually right. pick up a paper, although I, I read digitally too. So, yeah, but, but I when know what I you're do talking about. Sunday's paper, right? Yeah, front yeah. page, uh, right but there's there. Been, and there's been so many that mm -hmm. we're losing residents. Mm -hmm. It's not just... Uh, people of modest means. It's middle class people with mm -hmm. college degrees who are choosing to um, move, move somewhere else because they, they can't afford the home to buy a home or even to rent something they really like. Um, and the, and they're gonna, severely. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I'm just interjecting because that article, uh, it bring, brought it right home here to Arlington because one of the two or three people that they happen to focus on is the owner of a, kind of a local Arlington institution right here on Mass Ave and Jason Street, Laura's Sewing School, she, the, the woman is having to leave. She's right. more or less my age as well, which right. means she's laid some roots down here. Sure. And for her to have to take off to Minnesota, I think it is, is a real, you know, I understand why they po picked her as one of the people to focus on because that really does drive home what you're saying. Exactly. Which is, you know, these are people just like all of us. It's your friends and neighbors. You know, yeah. It's, it's your friends and neighbors. Mm -hmm. And if you were fortunate enough to buy into this market 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 or more years ago, great. But for a lot of others, it's causing extreme duress and difficulty. Mm -hmm. And business leaders are also weighing in mm -hmm. that this is an economic competitiveness issue. Mm -hmm. It's going to put us at a competitive disadvantage with other states. We thrive on high tech and biotech and lots of industries and to attract the kind of workers we need. Uh, and there was a big report that just came out that did the forecasting, the projections of the kind of workers we need in this state looking forward five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years. And the forecast was pretty dire on our ability to have the kind of labor and workforce development we need to continue to be successful as a state. Uh, I think Boston is now second in the country and the state of Massachusetts as a whole fifth in the nation for the most expensive. So mm -hmm. our biggest city um, is second and the state overall is fifth. And look, there are a lot of proposals for how to address this. I'm not saying rent stabilization or rent control, as it's called, is the only answer. Mm -hmm. You probably need a lot of tools in your toolkit. And there are a lot of policy ideas, broaden zoning laws to allow to, just to build more. You know, some folks say if, if the problem is, um, housing prices are too high, then it's classic economic model, supply, demand. You need more supply, you need more housing. But you know, that's an idea that's been peddled now for a decade. Uh, and in and of itself, I'm not sure is the solution. And mm -hmm. I think my bill would not impose rent control or rent stabilization anywhere. It's a local option bill. Mm -hmm. It just says, let's essentially um, restore the status quo ante before 1994 when the voters narrowly uh, repealed rent control. Because rent, rent control, you may know this, it was only repealed 5149. Mm. It was so tight. It might have been like 50.5 to 49.5. Mm. I, I forget the exact, but it was very really close. the narrowest. And more than a quarter century ago. Mm -hmm. 
So I had one a gentleman say to me, well, are you repealing the will of the voters if this passes? That's over a quarter century ago and passed by the thinnest of margins. So uh, I think it's entirely appropriate to revisit it. Yeah. Only three cities and towns had rent control when, uh, when it was the law. Mm -hmm. uh, Boston, Cambridge, and Brookline. Brookline right? mm -hmm. So there are 351 cities and towns in our, in our state, but only three had any kind of rent stabilization. So if we allow it to come back, who knows how many would adopt it. Right. But I think it makes sense as a local option. And it, my bill would allow landlords to raise rent, but just by a limited amount. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes sense to look at it carefully. Mayor Wu, Mayor Boston has a proposal. It's getting a lot of attention. She's got a little bigger right. megaphone than I do. Mm -hmm. At the moment, for sure. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have her in the conversation. Uh, I think I was the first one to reintroduce the idea of, of rent stabilization, rent control. And so we'll see where that debate goes. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it, it, it is a big deal, not just for social justice and economic justice, but as I said, business leaders are mm -hmm. really worried about our economic competitiveness as a state, as people are being driven out. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, it's good. It, this is a, this is an area where, according to, to studies, as you said, and what business leaders are forecasting, et cetera, you know, it's going to move from oh, this is such a you know terrible situation to actually we're not able to you know we're stagnating. We're not we're not able to keep growing in the way that we had you know have always been expecting. Exactly. Kind of things. So. Yeah. It, it's a, one of the biggest issues this state faces is mm -hmm. affordable housing. You know, I can't believe we got already to the end of our conversation, and I'm sure you have much more to share with us. So we'll just have to get you in sooner in the next quarter. Happy to come um, back. For, yeah, for a kind of a, a legislative update, the sequel, in a sense. <laughs> um, get Make sure we cover everything that we didn't get to today. But I do appreciate the conversation, I really do, especially, you know, we took a full third of it probably just to talk about your experience so far, um, you know, over these last 10 years, the things you've learned and what you're going to do with that. I feel like that was really worth it as well. So I, I appreciate to... the conversation as always. So thank you. I have been speaking, of course, to our state rep, Dave Rogers. He has been kind enough to join us here in studio. We always uh, welcome his presence and uh, we always appreciate his time. He's a busy man, took the time to be with us and to be with you. We also appreciate your presence here. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. I'm James Milan.